Look at this, police boss. This is 51 police officers in only one attack. 12 million dollars buried underground in a big blue canister full of plastic bags full of 100 dollar bills. Going down to the helipad of Pablo Escobar, we heard it's still original. He had buried more than 4,000 revolvers. He gave his 9mm gun to the priest. One of the biggest differences between what happens in the series Narcos to what actually happened is how he escaped. It's so early for us. No coffee. Yeah, we are here at this hotel in Medellin. Today is the Pablo Escobar tour, but the night, man. From 6 a.m. they were just making a fuss outside. <sighs> Either some guests taking a shower and it felt like the shower was right in front of our room. Or some crazy hotel personnel screaming, yelling in the hallways from 6 a.m. on. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, we have to go across town and I hope we find a coffee place because otherwise this vlog will be very boring because we're not awake the whole time. We slept very bad for days. Right. Because people here seem to tend, they tend to don't give a, give a F if other people sleep. I'm not used to that. Normally you try at least to be a bit quieter than you would be if you wouldn't care, right? Two pissed Germans in Medellin. <laughs> very nice. No, so the vlog is really starting in a good mood, yeah. <laughs> but maybe it'll cheer us up. <laughs> Point is a coffee. Right. Okay, coffee. That's a good idea. So let's grab, let's grab some coffee, right? Okay, guys, with a coffee in my hand, even though I haven't tasted it yet, I feel already better. Today, we are giving you a lot of information about Pablo Escobar. And most of you probably watched Narcos, but it's not all this, maybe how you see him. So, Colombians see it different and they have their own relation to the history. So this is going to be not the most positive video, but you will get a big insight into the real opinion of Colombians to Pablo Escobar. We are going to visit four different locations, all of them in the south of the valley of Medellin. I will tell you the history of what happened there. The first location that we are going to visit, the memorial park for the victims of the war of the Narcos. Why he ended up living here? Because this is a rich neighborhood. This is not the kind of area that he was preparing to live. It was the late 70s. This guy was getting a lot of money. So he decides to join the country club. And it's a big club where the wealthy people play golf, tennis, and the most important thing, it's very expensive to be part of the club. And they told him, no, you're not rich. You have a lot of money, but because you can't show us where all that money is coming from, everyone is going to assume that it's dirty money. So you're never going to be allowed in this club. So he told the owners of the club, no problem. What I'm going to do, I'm going to build my own club right in front of yours. And mine is going to be better for three reasons. I'm going to be in it, you are not going to be in it, and I'm going to put my name in big letters right at the entrance. So every day you're going to see my name, you're going to remember that I have more money than all of you. I built his six story building here, four stories of parking lot underground for his $12 million car collection that he was making for his son. A big helipad on top, swimming pool, bar, club, restaurant. His big apartment for he and his family. And for almost 10 years, the guy was living here with his family. And after almost 10 years, Cali Cartel came and placed a bomb right there, right at the entrance of the building. It was a great Toyota with 80 kilos of dynamite, and it was supposed to take the entire building down. But the Cali Cartel was missing two things. First, they set the bomb at 6 a.m., the bomb explodes at 7 a.m., but Pablo already left the building at 6.30 a.m., so he was not even in the building. Second, the building was bomb-proof, bullet-proof, earthquake-proof. So when the bomb explodes, no one inside the building dies. Only his daughter, Manuela, uh, suffered the loss of audition in one of her ears, in one side. So you can imagine, this this got him extremely angry, so he started bombing all these places that the Cali cartel was using to cover the illegal operations to wash the dirty money, stores, shops, and a chain of pharmacies. The thing with all these public places is that the people working in these places were innocent people. The clients of these places were also innocent people. And that's how more than 90% of the victims of this war were just innocent people standing in the wrong place at the wrong time. Okay, because we watched Narcos, I feel very good prepared, at least for the most important points in history of him. Sasha, I really wanted to do this tour because he was obsessed with the series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, I was. I'm was super excited. I, I think, I don't know, 
it's crazy. I'm kind of starstruck, if you can, can say that. Somehow relatable, because you've seen the series and, and he tells the stories and with a bump explosion and that's also in the series. Yeah. Of course, he's the hero in the series, so you feel kind also of related that. to him, uh -huh. which is also kind of dangerous to be related to someone who did a lot of bad stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's why we're doing the tour, to get a deeper insight and yeah. a more realistic insight. Yeah, better, better understanding of yeah. uh, what happened, right? Yeah. The series follows the story pretty well, but of course it's an adaptation for TV, so it has some differences. But it's usually smaller things like this. In the series, this guy got killed by sicarios. You know what sicarios are? The two guys on a motorcycle killing someone, escaping through traffic. Is that uh, there was another leader of another newspaper that got killed by sicarios in the streets. So they mix the two characters to make it a little more aesthetic. We are witnessing the growth of a generation without moral frontiers, without ethical principles or values. That's what we are trying to fight with some amount of clarity. He was publishing this in the first page of the newspaper once a week, in the opinion part, until he got killed. And he was helping the government a lot with all the, the information that everyone in the newspaper was getting from the narcos. He was giving all this information to the, to the government. Here we have Luis Carlos Galán Sarmiento. Maybe the most important politician that died by the hands of the Medellin cartel because this guy was running for president. And everyone was going to vote for him because his presidential campaign was we are going to fight the narcos with everything we have. And at that time the narcos had all the power because they had all the money. They were doing basically whatever they wanted here in Colombia. So this guy comes and says that we're going to stop that, everyone was going to vote for him. Pablo was trying to do, he was trying to buy the votes for this guy to become president and then be able to control him. But he was never willing to be controlled. So when he noticed, he started doing his political speeches directly against Pablo Escobar. That's when he became the enemy and that's why he got shot in front of more than 3,000 people while doing a public speech in live public TV and uh, everyone saw it live. The most incredible thing, the two guys that shot him, they disappeared in front of more than 3,000 people the first Minister of Justice relevant to this story because every time that the government wanted to speak directly with Pablo Escobar he was asking for the Minister of Justice because the Minister of Justice is in charge of the law of extradition the only thing that the narcos fear is to be taken to another country to prison because they know if they go to prison here in Colombia they can just pay to have lots of luxuries in the prison but if they are taken to the United States or another country they are going to be treated like real criminals that's the only thing they fear so he wanted to get this guy in his pocket to stop the law of extradition and then when he noticed that he was never going to help him, then he killed him. Being brave is not standing in front of the fallen in disgrace. It's standing in front of the ones that have the power of the money of the drug trafficking. The ones that believe that their great criminal and economical capacity makes them able to go over the state and step over the country. More than 35 years, the government has been collecting all these properties that used to belong to the narcos. And there are more than 48,000 of them around Colombia. And the government, basically, they don't know what to do with them. So they are taking some down, they are renting some of them, selling some of them, changing some of them for parks, for theme parks, for memorial parks like this. So the important part of this is that uh, they want to change how we see, how we use all these places. For more than 25 years, this was the ruins of a building. Police was here all the time, stopping the locals from entering, because after he died, everyone came to all his properties looking for the hidden money. So they started taking down the walls, digging holes everywhere, where most of these properties became very dangerous after a while because they were falling apart. That's why the police was always here. We were doing the tours, but we were standing outside of the ruins of a building telling you the story from the outside. And the government was trying to take down the building. But remember, it was bomb-proof, bullet-proof, earthquake-proof. So when they tried to take it down, all the demolition companies were saying it's more expensive to take it down than to build it again because they had to take it down brick by brick. Till eventually, after more than 20 years of asking, a German company came with this special liquid to put all the stuff. <laughs> it was a pretty big event for us. They closed this area of the city, the president came. After six months after that, we have the park. The locals are calling this the Pablo Escobar. And that's the complete opposite to what the government is trying to do, because it's not a park in memory of the guy, it's a park in memory of the victims of the war. The big black wall has around 43,800 little holes, each one representing a victim of the war. I think it's crazy if you see this many holes and you imagine everybody got like shot. It's also For me, it also represents shooting someone because of the holes. So, and it also reminds me a lot of the monument in New York, the victims of the terrorism, 9-11. It's always like 
goosebump moment. Yeah. What is the difference between the Narcos and the, I think the American version of, of the series and the uh, Colombian? I'm really interested. Biggest <laughs> differences will be that the Colombians, they, they don't want to accept part of the story. Because they don't want to believe like the, that the police was better than him, that he was a very bad guy at some point. So because some people were receiving a lot of things from him. They were receiving houses, money, even if they were not the ones receiving the things. Maybe their families were receiving things, so they were like grateful with him. The big difference between the Colombian series and the Narcos is that the character of Pablo Escobar in the Colombian series is like the exact copy of the guy. He speaks, he looks. He, uh, he moves exactly like Pablo Escobar, but the story is not very close to the real one. In Narcos, the story is closer to the real one, even if the character of Pablo Escobar is Brazilian. So, especially for Colombians, for us, yeah, the accent is like way off. M19, illegal guerrilla group, they wanted to take control of the plans of justice, to steal the criminal records of everyone and burn them. Pablo helped them by giving them explosives and weapons. In exchange, they stole his criminal record and burned them. Again, just to prove his point, because his criminal record at the time was stealing cars and trafficking marijuana inside Colombia. But at the same time, he was being charged of killing people, kidnapping people, cocaine trafficking, extortion, and a lot of worse things. Two, three, four, five. That's only one day and that's only in Medellin. Three days after that, two more. Most of the attacks are going towards public places because they were trying to hit the leaders of the other cartel. So the Medellin cartel places a car with a bomb outside of it. The bomb explodes at 9 p.m. or 10 p.m., kills 100 people, and the other guys were not even there. Two more banks here, two more here, one here. All the banks for the same reason, because they were not taking his money. Then at the end of the year, 89, the Medellin cartel started something called the Plan Pistola, the gun plan, basically offering Anyone who could kill a police officer received one million pesos. And if you killed a member of the elite force of the police, this is a small group formed just to find and kill him, the Bloque de Búsqueda, then you got twice as much, two million pesos. Sounds like a lot of money. It's actually like $500 right now, not that much. But at that time, it was the salary of almost six months. So the people were willing to kill for that amount of money. Even police officers were selling the information of how to get to their friends. People went completely crazy because of this. They were putting bombs in random places on the streets, waiting 100 meters away with a remote control for a police vehicle to pass by the bomb, explode the bomb, kill 20, 30, 40 police officers, go there, collect all the police badges from the uniforms, take all these uh, police badges to this small store in Envigado, where you just put them on a desk and get the money, no questions asked. Look at this, police boss. This is 51 police officers in only one attack. The Avianca plane, where the president was supposed to be, 112 people got killed in that plane. The president didn't even went to the airport that day. Police control point, truck of the elite force of the police, vehicle of the elite force of the police, El Poblado police station, right next to where we started the tour, pretty close to where everyone is staying. When you look at Medellin, it looks like one big valley with one big city, but it's actually 10 different municipalities, 10 cities, all together conforming what we call the metropolitan area of Medellin. Thousand meters higher than Medellin, that's where the, his prison is. Should have taken a jacket. It's refreshing. Up in the top of a mountain, the south of the valley. We're going to go around the entire place, but before that, we're going to start again with a history lesson. Why he ended up living here? Because it was impossible catching him. He already proved to the government for more than 12 years the police was following him and he was always disappearing right in front of them. He was able to enter pretty much any house, any store, any building, any place in Colombia and everyone was going to help him to escape through the back door, to hide inside because people were willing to help him. They were still grateful. Maybe they received something from him. Maybe their families did receive something from him or they were just too scared to say no because at that time, if you say no to Pablo Escobar, he was going to kill you and do whatever he wants anyway. So he already proved to the government that it was impossible catching him. He also knew that uh, there were lots of people throwing millions of dollars into killing him. So he knew that it was going to happen. It was the Cali cartel, Los Pepes, US government, Colombian government. So he knew that it was going to happen. So he decides to build his own safe place in the top of a mountain. First, we're going to stop the law of extradition. Second, I'm going to build my own place. It's going to be with my own money. I'm going to build it where I want it to be. The guards are going to be people from this city. And there is going to be a perimeter of three kilometers around the prison where the police and the government is not going to enter. You have to understand that all these buildings that we are going to see 
were rebuilt. After he died, everyone came to all his properties, especially to this one, to do camping, looking for the hidden money. They never found the money. So that's why most of these buildings are rebuilt in the same shape that they had, but some of them don't even have roofs. Also, these tiles, the colors, the decorations on the walls, this is made by the people in the retirement home because this is a free retirement home, so they survive from the money that we get to them. That's the party room with a VIP area for like 200 people. Check it out. You can see from here that it has a VIP area. I told him, you're going to stay here for a month. He's going to perform every day. And then at the end, he paid them three to five million dollars so they don't complain. Here you can see the original wall. This. It's, like, it's like this part. Inside, most of the thing is new. And the last time someone found money was like 300 meters away from here. 12 million dollars buried underground in a big blue canister full of plastic bags full of 100 dollar bills. The money was buried for so long in a very humid place that the humidity was able to go inside so the money was rotting, it was falling apart. One of the biggest differences between what happens in the series Narcos to what actually happened is how he escaped. Because in the series they show that this guy escapes through a tunnel and at the end of the tunnel there is a bunch of police waiting for him and uh, he negotiates with them and they allow him to go. It was kind of like that, not exactly like that. Remember this guy was going out of prison two, three times every day. He didn't need a tunnel to escape. Now we can take the trail that he took to escape for the first 150 meters. We can go to his personal praying spot. Original and that part of the wall is also original. That's like the only original concrete that remains here. <laughs> This is the trail that he took to escape. If you keep walking on this trail three and a half hours and you're back in the city again. That's his personal praying spot. So he had a chair right there where he was sitting right after lunch for 45 minutes to do some prayers. We know the statue is the original one where the locals are very religious so they are never going to touch a religious statue. So that's why we know that's the original one. The locals think that this is holy water. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have a sip of the holy water, of the holy Pablo Escobar water. It's crazy, right here in the spot where I'm standing, he used to sit for half an hour and pray to the Virgin Mary right here. It's, it's crazy, it feels so surreal, really. <laughs> this is where he escaped. But really, it's a nice spot here. I would also come here for half an hour every day to just sit and think and pray. Yeah, I think it's very schizophrenic to be that religious and still to do that much that is against the ten rules of the religion. I took a sip of the holy water. Ooh, so you're saint now? Yeah, or a drug lord. Oh, depends. No, it depends. No, it's from coming from the mountain, it's fresh. It's so crazy. Man, just crazy. You can go down to the heli pad if you want. Before that, let me warn you. Here we are 2,450 meters above sea level. There is not much oxygen up here. Everything up here takes a big effort. Again, the question, helipad is original? It's original. It was okay. repainted three times, so the paint is not original, but the pad is the, is the original one. When he came here, the first thing he did, he went to the government building over there. He turned himself in. Immediately, he went into a helicopter, came here, and when he landed here, he went down from the helicopter and he gave his 9mm gun to the priest. The priest that was living here with him. Mm -hmm. It was like a pretty symbolic act because behind him there were like 60 guys with big guns. <laughs> but he was handing his 9mm gun. Pretty symbolic act. Okay. Going down to the helipad of Pablo Escobar, we heard it's still original. Okay. That's strange at all. We are straight now. We are used to the altitude. How was it, helipad? It's like you're living a Netflix series. <laughs> right. Like reliving it, it's or at least getting a glimpse of it. It's true. All right, let's get going. Otherwise, our, our shower will leave we, without we us. We will be here like Pablo Escobar in prison, right? Have a feast here and call it prison. Yeah, so bring in the hookers. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I really enjoy this tour. It's very, a very good museum where you can really feel the history still living in the present a bit. When he was playing, the property right next to us. Once we get to the neighborhood, I'm going to let you know so you can look to the sides because we want to stop Amit. Some people think that he's coming from a very poor background 
and that kind of justifies what he was doing after. But no, he's coming from a middle class family in a middle class, very nice, very safe neighborhood. Very posh. Okay, like he said, the neighborhood looks really nice, very posh, a lot of nice buildings, very clean. We're going to start with the beginning of the story. He was not born in Medellin, he was born in La Union, a small town three and a half hours away that direction. When he was three years old, his family decides to come to the city looking for better opportunities. He was living here since he was a kid, so he knew everyone personally in this neighborhood. And then when he was like 16 years old, he was already getting enough money to buy houses close to where he lived. And he gave all these houses to the families that he knew were paying rent. But then he comes back to you and he tells you that you need to hide someone in your house for two months, three months. How do you say no? He just gave you a house. And even if you say no, he's going to kill you and do whatever he wants anyway. So that's how he ended up with so much power in areas like this. Everyone was willing to help him because they were still grateful or they were too scared to say no. Some years after that, he came and bought this piece of land, built a soccer field, gave it to the people. And two years after he gave it to the people, he closed the thing again with construction codes around it so no one can look inside because he was going to take something that he was hiding under the top right quarter of the football field. He had buried more than 4,000 revolvers. And with all these guns, he went to the outsides of Medellin, Cali and Bogota to poor neighborhoods where all these poor kids were dreaming about getting rich working for him. And he gave all these guns to the 13, 14 year old kids and he told them something like, now you work for me. Everything that happens here, you're going to let me know. And that's how he ended up with eyes and ears everywhere in Colombia. And then when he became a politician because he wanted to stop the law of extradition, he was using not only this one, but all the football fields that he built for the communities to do his political speeches. Because in all these places, everyone had a very, very good image of him. So they were supporting him from the beginning. understood we are going now to his grave where he is buried with his family and his closest friends or oh, friend. Well it's the most expensive cemetery in the city. All these people here they have paid for the first 15 to 25 years. After that your family has to keep paying if they want to give your body there or they take the remains of your body out to take the, to give them to your family so they can take them to a more permanent place like this flower pot here or the crypt over there. Those places you can buy them and they're forever. Pablo knew about this. He also knew that there were lots of people throwing millions of dollars into killing him. So he knew it was going to happen. So he came to a private cemetery and he bought a private piece of land. The black square over there is Pablo's private property and no one can take he or his family out of it. <laughs> Like I told you before, the black square here is Pablo's private property. He is buried here with only his closest family members, one of his employees. There he is. As you can see, he died December 2, 93, one day after his birthday. Luis Fernando, his younger brother, that died in a car accident in a vehicle that Pablo gave to him. Teresa is the nana, the nanny, the person that helps your mother to take care of you when you're a kid. He's considered a second mother for the Colombian culture. That's why she is here, right next to Pablo's mother. Hermilda, his mother, with her two sisters, the most recent additions to this tomb. This guy, Alvaro de Jesus Agudelo, that's Limon, the guy that started as a taxi driver, eventually became one of his closest friends, most trusted employees. He was the last one with him before he got uh, killed. And he died by going to the entrance of the house, trying to stop the police from entering. So that's how he got shot. And Manuel, his father's brother, Abel de Jesus, his father. You know, he didn't have a very good relationship with his father. At least at the end of his life, his father was not even speaking to him. And you know, Pablo gets all the attention because he was a crazy guy willing to show his face, public TV, threatening the president, and doing crazy stuff like that. And he was in charge of the military branch of the, uh, of the Medellin cartel. But the real brain of the operation, the real leader of the Medellin cartel was his cousin, Gustavo. Gustavo and Pablo were very close, but apparently not close enough for Gustavo to be here because Gustavo is buried right there. Technically, outside of Pablo's private property, so Gustavo's family has to keep paying. 
So he bought this property here on the private graveyard. And yeah, even kind of after his death, he makes fun of everyone because he, he outsmarted them. Because nobody can take it away. And Gustavo, both senior and junior, were members of the Medellin card. And after they killed Gustavo, Pablo knew that it was all downhill after that. After that, he was running from the police, then he went to La Catedral, then he escaped for a year, and then he got killed. Two planes track all the communications in Medellin. Every time they found Pablo's voice on the phone, they started tracing the call, and it took like eight minutes with the technology at the time. Pablo knew about this, so he was calling his family after he escaped from La Catedral every day. But he was spending less than two minutes on the phone and hung up. Only one time he forgot about it, because he was talking with his wife, about this guy getting shot in the morning, and that's why he spent almost 10 minutes on the phone. They were able to trace the call to the area where he was. They sent a team of police officers to do surveillance in that area until they saw him. And speaking of the phone on the second floor, Limon came to the entrance of the house, got killed. Pablo escaped on the roof, got killed. That's the official version of the story. There is a second version, and I personally think that's what his family wants to believe, because they don't want to accept that the police was actually better than him at some point. So they keep saying that he shot himself in the very last second. Also, who knows who Griselda Blanco is? She was the real cocaine lord at the time. This lady was in the business of cocaine 10 years before Pablo even knew what cocaine trafficking was. As usual, there is a lady in control behind all the guys. Again, all these guys get all the attention because they, they are the flashy guys. But this lady was the real cocaine lord. She's known as the Black Widow or the Godmother. And she is buried at the other side of this field so we're going to pay her a visit, cover her story pretty quick, then we can finish the tour. Three years ago, a Dutch guy was doing, posting Instagram stories doing lines of cocaine on top of Pablo's grave. Now he got kicked out of the country with a big fine and he's not allowed in Colombia anymore. <laughs> it's like like pilgrimage to Pablo Escobar's grave right. to do lines of cocaine on his... So, are you prepared? Get the cocaine out. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, it's crazy. So such a big cult still around him. I don't know if series around these people make it better or worse. It's a crazy phenomenon and it's very touchable here in this tour. It feels like the most authentic tour we've ever done. Yeah, and uh, he is, he's really honest and he also tells you his opinion on the things. Not that spectacular for someone that actually had more money than Pablo. Her story starts pretty similar to Pablo's. When she was five years old, her family came from Cartagena, Colombia, looking for better opportunities to the city of Medellin. First thing they did, sell her. These two guys that kept her captive in the worst neighborhood of Medellin, Barrio Antioquia, using her as a prostitute when she was just a kid. When she was 11 years old, she was able to get a knife, kill the two guys, escape. No one really knows what she was doing for the first part of her criminal career, but eventually she became the link between the Peruvians and the Mexicans. And she invented two things here in Colombia, cocaine trafficking, when she noticed that the further north you took the cocaine, the more expensive it got and every time you cross a border with it, you can double the price. She was also the first one ordering killings by sicarios. It's not like she invented contract killers, but she was the first one doing it with a motorcycle, two guys, automatic gun, killing someone, escaping to traffic. Like I told you before, it's almost impossible to stop them even today. And uh, when the Medellin cartel was in full operations, this lady was living in Miami, receiving five tons of cocaine a week and getting the distribution for all the big cities in the United States. She is known here in Colombia for two reasons. This may sound crazy, but I'm being very serious about this. She was considered very ugly. You know, beauty standards here in Colombia are pretty high, especially for women, especially in the city of Medellin. And she killed all the husbands that she married herself. Not like Pablo that was sending someone to kill someone. She killed them herself, standing right in front of them with her own personal gun. But she ended up getting killed by the same thing she invented, sicarios. I, outside of a meat store while walking in a poor neighborhood. And no one took responsibility for it, but we blame the remains of the war of the Medellin and the Cali Cart. And now the craziest part of the story, because she had no family left, because her family sell, uh, sold her. The government decided that because she was still legally married with the first husband that she killed, now she's buried here with him. But this poor guy, Luis Fernando Restrepo, is condemned for almost 10 more years with the ugly lady that killed him on top of him. And I think that's karma for both of them. So that, that was the Pablo Escobar tour. You tell me how was it and any kind of questions, not only about this, about literally anything that you want to ask, let me know. That has been our Pablo Escobar tour here in Medellin and I think it was one really of the best tours that we've done so far. Yeah, total recommendation, 25 bucks per person, totally worth it. If you're here, do it. It's really authentic, it's emotional, it's, I don't know, you get the full experience, it's crazy. Check it out.